Swarmers, welcome back to the hive. So as our world makes the shift from traditional fossil fuel based energy sources to intermittent sources of renewable energy, including solar, hydro and wind power, actual storage of this energy is going to become extremely important in maintaining the consist consistency of our energy supply. Increasing demand from our ever-increasing population will also place added burden on already aging energy infrastructures. So today we are here talking with Aidan Snyder, co-founder and chief operating officer of Orenda. Orenda is working to implement energy storage technologies all across the U.S. to help stabilize the transition to a renewable energy future, which is amazing. So hi, Aiden. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Can't wait to learn more about what's what's going on with Orenda. So I guess let's start with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your path towards sustainability? Yeah, so so my background, I guess, professionally has always really been in the, the energy storage industry. Um, you know, immediately out of college, I started by working for uh, a consulting group, a trade consortium in New York State that essentially, you know, their role is to help accelerate the growth of the energy storage industry in New York. Um, and so that was, you know, my first job after college and, and really just ended up being what, what pushed me to go further into that area. Um, you know, I loved working there and, and really thought it was an exciting place to be. Um, and so, you know, my, my thought process after I was there was that I needed to get a bit closer to the projects themselves and really move out of a consulting role where I was telling people how to do something um, to an area where I was actually trying to do those things myself. Um, you know, sort of backing up even a step further before that, both of my parents were, were involved in sort of the extended renewable space. Um, and so, you know, it had always been something that was, you know, on my mind and, and something I was interested in doing. Um, but it was really just sort of a luck of the draw thing as much as anything else, um, you know, ending up with that job out of college in a growing industry really set me up to be able to do, you know, some pretty cool things. Very cool. So then from there, you co-founded Orenda. So tell us, what exactly does Orenda do? Like, what are y'all up to in the energy sector? Yeah, so we really do two things. Um, you know, there's the development side, which is what I lead, and that's focused on, you know, finding projects and, and helping our project partners to build them. Um, so ultimately, we don't own the assets long term. That's, that's what our partner brings to the table. Um, but we bring, you know, the energy storage specific knowledge and, and help support them building out this new type of project for them. Um, on the other side, we, we have a software platform that basically maximizes the, the revenue potential of these projects. So it essentially predicts, you know, when certain events are going to occur that are important to our, our revenue proposition on the projects. And so those are really the two sides of what we're focused on. You know, I'm really sort of siloed into the development side of things, but, but a lot of my other colleagues are focused on the more technical software side of, of the company. Hmm, I see. Cool. So then with your expertise, how, how does this renewable energy storage technology differ from what's currently going on with energy infrastructure? Yeah, so, so I guess there's, there's sort of two sides to that question. The first is, you know, renewables versus a traditional gas plant or coal plant or nuclear plant. You know, all of those are built in such a way where the only limiting factor on what they can produce is actually having the fuel handy. But you know you can always make sure that you have enough coal stockpiled or enough natural gas in your pipelines to make sure that plant's running all the time. With renewables, you know wind only produces power when the wind is blowing. Solar only produces when the sun is out. And so you know that's really where the role of batteries comes in. Um, you know. You know, beyond that, batteries are, are a much more sort of modular piece of energy infrastructure. So you can see batteries, you know, down to, you know, a few hundred kilowatts, which is, you know, enough to power maybe 10 to 15 houses um, or, you know, up to actually Con Ed, uh, the utility here in New York today, they announced a procurement for 100 megawatts of storage um, that they're going to be installing in Queens somewhere. I, I don't know the exact location, um, but they actually announced that today. And so it, it really can serve a lot of different roles. The projects we're building are really focused on providing benefits to the distribution system. So think about, you know, the wires that are bringing power to our houses rather than, you know, the wires that are bringing power from upstate New York to downstate New York. 
And so, you know, we're targeting a little bit of a different use than than sort of the traditional power plant would go after. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of different ways you can apply storage and storage can mean a lot of different things. You know, there there is storage that's been on the grid for 100 years, but it's these massive pumped hydro facilities that, you know, essentially just fill up a reservoir. And then when they want to get the power out, they just let the water down through the turbines. And so, you know, there are a lot of different types of storage. What we're focused on are specifically battery-based storage projects. Hmm. And so, I mean, in a, it, we're talking to our viewers here who are hopefully all like, green warriors, right? And we're all, we all have sustainability on our minds, but why is this important then to you at least? Well, so it's important because, you know, nobody's ever going to accept only having power sometimes. Um, and, you know, so, so when you want to transition to renewables, you have to figure out how to do that without changing the status quo in terms of, you know, when I turn the lights on, I want them to turn on. I don't want to have to wait because, you know, it, there isn't enough power to go around. And there were sort of those, you know, horror stories out of California this summer where they had some issues, um, you know, with reliability and some brownouts, which they hadn't seen for, you know, over 20 years. Um, and so, you know, that's really where storage can come into play. Now, the California situation wasn't actually it was more sort of a, a transmission question um, and a playing things safe question than, you know, any generation uh lacking. Um, but, you know, that's really what storage is there to do is avoid those sort of horror stories where, you know, there isn't power when you need it. Right. Especially as we're, you know, transitioning, hopefully, to these renewable sources, which we all want to do that, right? So we have to make it possible and realistic for us to live in that world. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, we read that, let me find this here, the statistic that I want to pick your brain about. The International Energy Agency, estimates that the world needs 266 gigawatts of energy storage by 2030 to keep global warming below two degrees Celsius, which we need to do. So can you explain how energy storage, what you're doing, will play a key role in mitigating climate change? Yeah, so, so from a climate change perspective and from a carbon emissions perspective, you know, storage's real role is about balancing the power from other sources. Um, you know, ultimately, we don't generate any power. Um, and right. you know, a battery project is only as clean as the power it's charged by. Um, so the idea with storage to, to and I hadn't seen this, this study before, so I, I don't know exactly what that stat's referring to. Um, and, you know, my knowledge is really pretty limited when it comes to the international, you know, markets for storage. Okay. They all work very differently. Um, but in general, you know, storage is there to help facilitate, you know, the, the installation of a lot more renewables. And it's beyond just the, the sort of time shifting. Um, there's also, you know, something called hosting capacity, which basically refers to how much power you can inject onto the grid in a certain area. Um, and batteries can play a role in increasing the hosting capacity, which basically allows you to build out more renewables in the areas where it's possible. So obviously, when you think about somewhere like New York, where, where, where I'm based, it's much easier to build you know, a big wind farm you know, up by Albany or, or out towards Buffalo or in the southern tier than it is in Westchester. Um, and so, you know, it really helps you to facilitate, you know, the, the installation of renewables is ultimately the role it plays. Yeah, cool. So actually, I was just going to ask you about like the energy storage roadmap in New York and, and, and how you work with it. You kind of talked about it, but can you uh, speak a little bit more on that? Yeah, so, so the energy storage roadmap in New York has sort of been superseded um, by something called the CLCPA. That's the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act or something, uh -huh. um, I, I believe is what it stands for. Um, and that's actually legislation that was passed by, by the state last year that sort of mandates these, these targets get reached. So when you talk about the roadmap, that was more an, of an, a discussion and a regulatory change to, okay, we should try and do this thing. Whereas the CLCPA actually puts it into law and says, you know, okay, we have to do these things. And so that's really sort of shifted, uh, you know, the goalposts quite a bit. And so the CLCPA basically says, you know, the state wants to have 100% renewables across the entire economy by 2040. That includes things, or by 2050. That includes things like transportation, you know, everything, uh, heavy industry, all of that. And the electric grid, they want to have 100% renewable by 2040. 
And so that's really increased uh, the amount of you know, storage and, and solar and wind that we need to install over the next 20 years. Um, it's, you know, I believe the previous goal was 70% renewable by 2040. Um, and so obviously, you know, the more renewables you have, the harder it is to get that last five, 10%. Um, it's relatively easy to get to a 90% renewable grid, but it's much harder to get to you know, the 100% renewable grid. Um, and so the state actually just commissioned a new study by Siemens um, that I, I actually don't know if it's out yet or if it's coming out in the, the next couple of days. It's, it has to be out by the end of the year um, that talks about you know, how do we actually achieve these goals. And it says we're going to need 15 gigawatts instead of the three gigawatts, which was the roadmap target, that will need 15 gigawatts of short duration storage meaning sort of two to six hours, um, and then another 15 gigawatts of, of sort of seasonal storage, meaning you know something like a renewable natural gas or, or hydrogen or pump storage or whatever it is, um, but of that much longer duration storage. Hmm. So what's your personal thought on these goals? Like, are these achievable? <laughs> They're certainly achievable, um, but they're not easy to achieve. And uh, you know, there's still quite a few questions that need to be worked out in terms of the where will they get deployed, how will they get deployed, and when will they get deployed, referring more broadly to all renewables projects. And so, you know, certainly achievable, um, but definitely, you know, a lot of things that still need to be worked out. Hmm. So, in order to achieve these, then continuing to kind of look to the future, what other technologies are in development, even with Arenda or, or that you know of that, or that are needed to make long term sustainability viable? Um, so I guess the the sort of, you know, remaining technology gap um, would be on price reductions on the existing technology. So, you know, as these things get more mature, they get cheaper and you can install them in more places. Um, and so that's, you know, probably the biggest thing is just the continued reduction of cost for sol solar, wind, and regular traditional battery storage. Um, that's probably the first thing, you know, the, as I mentioned just a, a moment ago, the, the real hard part is that last five to 10% of, of electrification. Um, and so that's really where you need to just sort of make a decision about what we're going to use for that really long duration storage. Um, a lot of different candidates, uh, you know, there's, there's hydrogen, um, that's sort of probably the most likely. Um, you've seen a lot of, a lot of hydrogen-based projects in some of the Northern European countries. Um, that's one candidate. There's also, you know, pumped hydro, but there you need to accept that you're going to have to, you know, take the top off a building or, or not off a mountain, I mean. Um, and so, you know, that obviously has its own environmental ramifications. And so it sort of becomes a question of, of what is the most acceptable pathway. Um, and then there's, you know, renewable natural gas, which is, you know, another question and has its own, you know, sort of environmental attributes where there's going to have to be some give at some point um, and not all of them are, will be perfect. I think the best example of that is there's a, uh, a proposed um, high voltage transmission line uh, to bring hydropower from Quebec um, down to New York City. And that would provide, you know, I don't know, 30% of New York City's power, roughly. Um, wow. it, it would vary depending on the time. Um, but that's seen a ton of pushback because it would need to go underwater down the Hudson and, and through the Champlain, uh, mm. through, through Lake Champlain. Um, and so, you know, there's that sort of push and pull between, you know, is clean energy more important than, you know, the, the sort of ecolog ecological damage that could occur from that type of project. And so, you know, that's one of those scenarios where you see a lot of back and forth from groups that traditionally would be on the same side of the coin. Um, and so, you know, ultimately it's, there isn't going to be a perfect solution, um, but, you know, decisions will need to be made around, you know, what is the least harmful solution here? Yes. Yeah. Right. When we're like blazing these new trails, there's so much to learn and, and it's easy to forget about the implications of the new decisions that we're making and what they could be and what, you know, further potential issues could arise and all of that. So it's super amazing to have such forward thinking people in this industry and in this sector. Um, it's just step by step, right? <laughs> um, speaking of which, I guess we always like to wrap up with um, what is your favorite sustainability tip for our viewers? 
Um, you know, we just said you take it step by step. What are some of your favorite steps <laughs> towards uh, sustainability? So I guess, I guess to a large extent, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a believer that, you know, sustainability is one of those things that largely has to come from the top down. Um, so it's, it's sort of a very structural issue. So when you think about something like, you know, even as simple as, as say recycling, you know, is the most effective way to do that to convince people to change their actions or is the most effective way to do it to have, you know, single stream recycling available where, you know, you have one recycling bin and, and a trash bin and you put those out and then, you know, sort of it gets taken care of as it goes through. Um, so I generally tend to believe that that the most impactful things to be done are sort of more structural changes, meaning, you know, okay, we need to have less polluting out of our grid. Um, not necessarily that less electricity needs to be used. And I think, you know, you've seen a lot of this over the last, say, 10 to 15 years, um, where, you know, New York's grid, the electricity use has actually been on a downward trend uh, recently. And that isn't due to any changes in, in people's actions, that's due to appliances becoming more efficient. Um, you know, TVs, obviously, an LED TV uses hardly any power when compared with sort of an old school, you know, tube-based TV. And so, you know, I think that the way I have always looked at it is that, you know, the real change does need to come sort of from structural changes rather than any change to someone's actions. Um, you know, I would expect that's a somewhat controversial view with your viewers, um, but that's just, you know, the way I've always looked at it. No, I, I honestly happen to agree. I think a lot of people would agree that, I mean, of course, I don't think you're voting anyone stop recycling and start using as much plastic as possible. I mean, ideally everyone's doing their part in whatever way that they can and, and that's what we can do. But to your point, it's like also, you know, write to your government officials, call them, make support, vote with your dollar, right? Support these um, companies that are putting out these much more sustainable options and, and watch these videos, learn about what's going on and see how you can support companies like yours and uh, just let that sort of drive us to the future of sustainability. Because I, I agree, there's, there is so much that each individual can do, but at the same time, there's only so much that each individual can do. And we need companies like yours to assist us little green warriors all over the world. When we band together, we make a difference. That's true. But um, being able to store renewable energy and make it a viable option for humanity, literally to use in the future is changing the world in this amazing way. And we're so grateful for the work that you do for all of us so that we can use renewable energy. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. It's been really interesting to learn about what you do and really a joy to speak with you and I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you for having me. So thank you so much for joining us, Aiden and wondrous swarmers out there viewing this. We love you. Thank you so much for joining as always. Don't forget to like and share and subscribe to the swarm and we will see you next time.